I'm just here to see Stephen Lang. I'm kind of excited. I'm definitely excited to see him. For the actor and the director to be in the same room, it's pretty insightful. My name is Eric Brown. I work here as a veteran outreach coordinator. Uh, also the athletic director here at the New York Film Academy. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This is a full house. I love it, especially as a veteran myself. And I know we have uh, a lot of veterans here tonight. Um, I want to thank also the veteran, uh, veteran Affairs Office for setting this up, or services, should I say, for setting this up tonight. I think this is great personally as a vet. You know, this means a lot to me when I see individuals uh, such as Stephen Lang and Larry Brand bringing something like this to the big screen. You know, uh, I sound kind of shaky right now, but because it does mean a lot to me. You know, um, I have family members who serve, just as some, some of us uh, amongst us have family members who served as well. Uh, and it does, you know, a great honor for someone to come up and depict, you know, certain events like that, you know, that shaped, you know, the, the course of history. And uh, I, I just really uh, do, you know, want to give that acknowledgement. First, I want to acknowledge uh, Director Larry Brand for really uh, creating this piece. It's beautiful. Uh, growing, going from places to places to uh, get connected with the service members uh, in their travels. Also, I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing an amazing man, a great actor. You know, we've seen him on his uh, you know, acclaimed performance in 2009, James Cameron Avatar. Marine in an Avatar body. That's a potent mix. You get me what I need, I'll see to it. You get your legs, babe. Your real legs. Hell yeah, sir. Boone. Yes, Jim. I'm going into the next office. Um, without further ado, I would like you guys to give a warm welcome, a warm New York Film Academy welcome, a warm round of applause for director Larry Brand and actor Stephen Lang. <laughs> Stephen, I, I really appreciate you coming out here like this. This is, this is great. I love it. I mean, you may have heard me do kind of sound kind of shaky. I mean, things like this always move me in a way that uh, can be explained. And I really do appreciate uh, you coming out here. So it's, it's a great honor to see uh, someone such as yourself uh, really give, give your everything into every, every element, you know, of every uh, story that's been, that was been told, uh, portrayed inside, you know, this film. And I, I really do thank you for that, to be honest. And thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I really do thank you for that. Thanks, brother. Seriously. Really uh, thank you. Um, big debt of gratitude to the New York Film Academy for hosting this, and and, and thanks to each one of you for, uh, you know, for coming out and uh, battling the Obama traffic tonight and uh, and spending a couple of hours with us. Your feedback is extremely important to us, and um, and so we really do want to hear what 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 you think of the whole whole thing, and we're uh, more than happy to try to answer any questions you may have, and we like to hear uh, good words, and we also are more than prepared to hear uh, criticism as well. So, uh, as you can tell, it's a, uh, I think that, that filming theater is a risky proposition at best all the time. I don't know that theater translates particularly well to the screen without major, um, or filming a show per se generally doesn't work. It's very, very hard to duplicate or recreate that energy that happens between uh, an actor and an audience. And at the same time, I felt as I've been doing this for so many years that I wanted more than a record of it. I wanted to at least see if in some fashion we could uh, try and, and, and create a uh, an equivalent experience using using film. And Larry Brand and I have done two films previously together, and I felt that he would be a, a, a filmmaker who would really understand um, 
the material and really go at it with a in a way I, I never could not being a filmmaker and and I must say the process I, I uh, you know when you see the troops applauding uh, or civilian audiences for that matter when they applaud this show they certainly are applauding the um, uh, the themes of the show and uh, the uh, but but I also think they're applauding the effort that's involved they just sort of see the work that goes into it and that's one of the things we 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 work towards in this film as well uh, is just the the sheer effort of of trying to do something how successful you are who who can tell because it's not a straight narrative uh, picture of course not even quite sure how to characterize it whether it's a documentary or a, a performance documentary or exactly what it is. Anyway, happy to, I'm just sort of rambling talk <laughs> for a while and uh, happy to continue on in any way you like. Of course, of course. And Larry, I re we really do thank you for uh, sure. taking, that, taking on this role. I want to know, like, how, how did this all come to be? You know, where did it start? Where did it start from, like, its inception? Like, where did, where did this all uh, generate from? I had a big flop in uh, 2003, uh, Gods and Generals. I was very proud of the movie, very proud of the work that we'd put into it, and again, very proud of the effort. And the film died for lots of reasons, and I felt that, oh, that was that, that's that. <laughs> and, uh, and I began to, I was really looking for something that I could apply myself to. Um, and uh, and I, a basketball buddy of mine, uh, gave me this book that he had just written, hadn't come out yet, first-hand accounts of, from uh, living Medal of Honor recipients. And, and it just kind of knocked me out. And I just began messing around with it. And beyond glory, the solo performance is what emerged. And from 2004 through 2007, I did very little of anything else. I did a few gigs here and there, but mostly I worked on this. And then from 2007 through 2013, I retired it. And then back in 2013, I brought it back to the stage I'd been asked to, and so I did, and was fortunate to play it commercially, but also to play it for the troops, which I always had. And back in 2005, when I was first touring it all over the world, in the Persian Gulf, to Iraq, to Guantanamo, to Guam, to the DMZ in Korea, uh, literally all over the globe, there were many, many times that I, I wish that what I was experiencing was being captured on film. And so when we brought it back in 2013, and I did take it again, I took it to Afghanistan, and uh, one of the stipulations with the military was that they allow us to film it. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, I had a lot of footage and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so I turned to Larry, and, and, and that's, that's, kind of, that, that's kind of the genesis of it. It just seemed to me to be worth doing. That's simple, you know. And Larry, what was your, some of your first thoughts when Stephen uh, came to you with this, with this idea? Well, uh, first let me just say one thing. Um, there's a card at the beginning of the movie that does say that the temp, it's a very temp mix, so the sound was kind of going in and out, and I apologize that we, you hadn't been warned. This is not by any means the final mix, and it really sounds very, very different. Um, Stephen actually had like 200 to 300 hours of footage on, on, a, on a RAID hard drive, like a 16 terabyte hard drive. And I just, I went up to his place, uh, we both live in Manhattan, and... Um, you know, I just started looking through the footage to basically to kind of guide him through looking through the footage. And he just said, well, what do you think? And I, I took home. He had just done the, the Flea Theater, which is that small theater with the aisle in the middle with the audience on both sides. It features prominently. And I, I went home that afternoon and I, I just cut that together, which was the simplest cut ever because there were two cameras. And mm -hmm. if the cameras pointed at his back, I cut to the other camera. And, um, and I said, well, you know, I... I, I I'm not a documentarian by nature. I've done one documentary before, but it was also kind of a performance piece. And uh, I felt that the narrative of the characters was really what was important, and that formed the spine of the, 
of the uh, of the movie. So even though that on its own would have been hard to sit through for an hour and a half, because as as Stephen says, you know, it's a very different medium, and it's one thing to be in the presence of an audience and and interacting on that level and kind of charismatically do that. It's another thing to to be on the screen. And so the advantages of being on the screen are you have close-ups and you have sound effects, and or you should have sound effects, sound design, music. Um, so I, I said, look, I think it's about the play, it's about the performance, and use these other elements, interaction with the soldiers, just to humanize it and to, I mean, certainly the Baker character, right. when he sits down with those black soldiers. I mean, that was just, I wasn't there for that. It was the, the footage was shot without me, but I was just, as soon as I looked at that, I said, that's in the movie. You know, so there, was, there are those moments there where you're humanizing him and you're seeing him, in a, him, in his, him as him, and then it's a little bit more uh, resonant when you see him slip into a character, like when he dis discuss, discusses Sasser, the, the second the Vietnam character, mm -hmm. and then you hear him talking about it, and then the next thing he's that character. So I thought that, that was, it was really to enhance those performances and, uh, and just to kind of highlight the performance in such a way that that was what was carrying it. And, and the, the external things, the kind of the, 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 the bells and whistles, were really there just to kind of make it feel like a movie as long as the performance and the stories of these men were really what's the important factor. Okay. And, and how did you feel the first time you, you performed uh, on stage? Like, what was, what was the feeling? Terrified. First time I did it, when I started doing this show, first performances were in Arlington at a little theater called the Theater at the Women in, National, in Military Service Memorial uh, at the gate, literally at the gate of Arlington National Cemetery. So it was a very kind of, um, it was a very cool place to do it. However, nobody in Washington knows there's a theater there. So there were, and when I first started doing it, there were many nights when I played for two or three people. And uh, of course it was difficult at the time, but looking back on it, uh, and even as to some extent as I went through it, I regard it as one of the greatest, greatest uh, exercises in humility of my entire life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were originally slated for a six week run and then the, then the Washington Post uh, came and and saw it and they reviewed it and then we sold out for ten weeks so that that was a that was a good thing uh, but I <laughs> I always I, I every time I am about to go do it on stage I feel like I'm walking to the guillotine mm -hmm. seriously and then you get out there and you're cool and you know within a line or two if they laugh at Finn talking about waking up with a pup tent situation, <laughs> you know, okay, this house is gonna be okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and you get into it, but it's a, it's a real workout is what it is for me. So I still kind of like doing it just because it's a physical challenge and, mm. and audiences, uh, uh, they respond to it, you know, as I say. So I'll probably keep doing it for a while. Nice. I think. Yeah. And what was some of the feedback that you got from the uh, service members when you performed? Well, you know, servicemen are, they're appreciative of you coming out and demonstrating that you, uh, you care right, about them, certainly. But there, were, there was, a, I, I do remember one performance in, uh, uh, in South Korea where a sergeant major came up to me uh, before the show and said, Mr. Lang, I want you to know that you are going to have a full house because these men have been ordered to be here. <laughs> and I thought, oh, they're really going to enjoy it a lot, you know? And you can even see when you look at the military audiences here, you know, you would want, if you're going to cut to the audience, you really want an audience that's just sort of all alive and like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. But military audiences, just as a rule, tend to be more contained in a way. That's one of the reasons I started doing it with a microphone and started doing it a more, I do an annotated version of the show most of the time when I do it for the military right now, because this show runs 80 solid, relentless minutes is what it is. And I find with the military audience that, that, that it's really better if, I, if it comes in around 45 minutes and I really do kind of interplay with them to really kind of, you know, goose the house up because they don't know what the hell they're seeing. You know, it's not like uh, I'm, a, I'm a rock band coming out or a comedian coming out. This is a, it's a kind of a unique and peculiar sort of thing. So, but by the end of it, I mean, they're always... Um, pleased 
and delighted. Did you get a chance to meet some of the, uh, the Medal of Honor recipients? I do. I know quite a few of them. And when I started it, all eight were alive. Two are still with us. Uh, uh, Clarence Sasser, the medic from Vietnam, when we played Texas last year, he, he traveled around. He came to the, see the show three times and uh, is a great friend. Um, also, I was privileged to perform it for S Senator Inouye uh, on his 80th birthday at the U.S. Senate uh, forum there, and that was, that was good. <laughs> nice. Uh, awesome. The others all signed off on it, and, uh, but I've always shy about meeting them, uh, and, and the reason is, is that what I'm doing up there is not a photograph, it's a painting. It's by definition impressionistic, you know? And, and that story that I like to tell about Vernon Baker, about, well, I always figured it would be Morgan. I mean, it's just sort of, it, it kind of encapsulates the way I feel about the whole thing. It, it, it's, uh, I have no business playing mm. these guys right. <laughs> in a way, but, but I want to do it anyway. Yeah. But uh, I feel I know them, and they're, they're in many ways, you know? No. My personal question, you know, now you mentioned Vernon Baker, like, I want to know how it felt, uh, or what did you have to go through the process of embodying, you know, um, let's say an African American soldier, dealing with those trials and tribulations at that particular time period. I mean, what was the process and, and what are some of the thoughts that you had going through your mind at that particular time? Well, all, it's a tough question. The only thing I can say is that the, I give a tremendous credit to Larry Smith, the journalist who did this book, because I never, ever felt the journalist intruding, it, which is to say that the voices of the men themselves came through in such an unvarnished, ungussied up way. They came, they, they rang truly. And when I say the voices, I, I don't I don't just mean the words, I mean the actual voices. I, I, I heard the voices very clearly and the voices, and so the voice of Vernon Baker, uh, that it came out of me the way Baker filters through me. How does that, how, that's just part of a, the, the process of acting which is by nature somewhat mysterious, <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems to me. Yeah. But, you know, there's also physical manifestation, and clearly, he is a man who uh, was a um, he. He went through s this systemic racism for mm. for many many years, and yet he's w with this tremendous pride. It seems to me so that figures in the stature of the man. It figures in the walk. It figures in the way in the set of his hands. In fact, in the in the square of his shoulders. The same is true of each of each of the men in their, in their way, you know? And, and so, I don't know if that's an adequate answer, but it's, you know, I it's felt, kind of the way it works. I mean, me personally, I felt like you did, you know, did him a service. I, I felt really connected to what you were doing, and I, I thought it was beautiful. And I was always was just wondering, like, you know, what did he do? What was the process? How did he, you know, come about generating uh, that type of persona, even not meeting him firsthand, right. you know? Right. And that was just one of the questions I wanted well, to ask. Well, you see the photographs, of Vernon, there's a beautiful, at peace, benign quality to him, and I know a lot about him, and uh, so that, that's how it happened. But as I say, I'm not trying to duplicate Vernon of Baker. Course, of course, You know, when you play Babe Ruth, you gotta be Babe Ruth. Right. There's really nothing impressionistic about it. But when you play Nicky Bacon, it's, Hector Caffarata, the Jersey guy, he, I based him completely on my Uncle Sonny, who was a Marine. So they had an equivalent experience. But this is, it's my way of doing Sonny. So, nice. you know. And Larry, what uh, challenges did you guys face uh, in, in shooting this? I mean, if, if any. Well, all. fortunately, I didn't, I didn't face so many challenges shooting it because a lot of the footage, the documentary already, stuff was already there. Um, the real challenge was being presented with two, two or three hundred hours of footage and as a giant jigsaw puzzle and trying to find ways to, uh, to, to give it a through line. 
And what I discovered early on was the important thing in cutting this, this, this picture, because unlike most feature films where, unless you're Scorsese, you care something about matching in terms of, I mean, everybody here is a filmmaker, so matching uh, is very, very important in terms of whether his hat is on or his hat is off. Nothing really mattered in this movie, because in some scenes he's wearing a black cap, in others he's, he's in costume, in others he's uh, on, a, on an aircraft carrier, sometimes he's in a little theater. What mattered was mainly the emotional continuity of his performance. Performance. And secondarily, almost as important was the physical, his body language, what his body was doing. So the main challenge was, was finding this kind of dramatic through line where you know, obviously, that you're being taken from venue to venue, mm -hmm. but it seems effortless. It's not, it's not getting in the way. It's actually enhancing the experience of it. So just when, you know, if you're going to show one scene in one venue too long, it's like, okay, at the point where... It, it, it gets to be, it loses energy, you're, you're at another venue. So to, to use those, which could be a huge deficit, into a major advantage, uh, that was the major. I mean, the other, the other parts, of course, were coming up with, my brother did the CG, all the CG uh, nice. work as well, and kind of coming up with themes and, and trying to create... Uh, I think early on he came up with the idea of doing a stage, and I didn't want to do a stage because we have a million stages, and then he came up with the idea of a theater in the round, which I thought was really kind of interesting, uh, because it almost has a Twilight Zone feel. It's where is this theater? Who are, it's empty. All the seats are empty. Uh, and I've always had the conception, and the only people who are ever going to know this are people who actually hear me say this, but to me those empty seats represent the soldiers that couldn't be there. And uh, unlike the real soldiers, there's always an exit sign. Uh, in the background, and even so, so you're always aware of looking off the stage. There's, there's no even, even in the cell scene with Stockdale. There's a point where I'm wide enough that you can see the exit sign behind. So Stockdale didn't have an exit sign. Right. We do. And so conceptualizing. And five people used it during the during the movie. <laughs> yeah, but I two, counted. But two, two did come. Two back. came back then. Yeah, two, he did. Well, he really did count. Um, I, I worked for Roger Corman, and we used to have uh, test screenings, which would basically mean we would own a theater for a night, and and somehow they'd take out ads. And if somebody peed during a seat during a scene, you'd have to cut that scene. So I, I got very gun shy watching people get up and. And walk out. And sometimes, Roger, you know, the guy was 90. He had to go pee. You know, and Roger's saying, no, no, you've got to, you've got to, right. I think they were getting bored here. <laughs> Bathroom stuff. Awesome. So, and Steve, I, I want to ask, like, um, during, during your time, like, during, during the research and, and also during the performances, did you notice any, uh, if any, similarities between uh, story, transitioning from story to story uh, for those uh, you know, specific characters, like, uh, you know, let's say the ones who served in the Pearl Harbor time frame or, mm. you know, during the Vietnam era, you know, or even just from one era to the next. I mean, what, sure. what similarities did you notice, if any? Well, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the piece itself is quite intentionally completely shorn of politics. There's not a shred of politics in it. There are a few flags in it. That's because I play to the military. What, you know, when you play to the military, they set the stage. When I play this in theaters, there, it's not a flag-waving show. There's nothing rah-rah about it in the least. So it doesn't matter that World War II was a good war, and it doesn't matter that Vietnam was a bad war or that Korea was a forgotten war. It doesn't make any difference to, 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 to the soldiers. It's what they're doing, they're doing what has to be done. Uh, what keep what what binds these men together is they're 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 just words, but it's uh, um, it's humility is the main the main thing, and by that I mean a, there's a selfless quality to what they did because each one of them received the Medal of Honor for doing something that you do not have to do. There, if you don't perform that above and beyond, no one will ever think the worse of you. And, um, but, but yet they did it because they felt that it had to be done. And in many cases, they're still astounded by their own actions. And some of them are not in the least astounded. They said, it's just, I was just doing, if I didn't do it, I didn't know who the hell was gonna do it, so I did it. And so uh, they're all, uh, bound together by that by to me what is finally a sense of humility but also by other qualities which is to say uh uh courage and uh 
uh, and bravery, which are really two different things, I think. And um, just uh, the, each of the, the each of the events is kind of the pebble in the pond of their life. And what happened is, is that the ripples, it ripples in all directions. And so when you talk, when Nick Bacon talks about, I was born in, in Arkansas and my mother and, I did, and I, looked, I did this, everything he did, all the hardship that he had and all the hard work that his mother did and, and the fact that his father was so ill, every, every moment of that life is what pre pre prepared him to do what he did that day which became the defining moment of his life. And every day of his life up until his death three, three years ago was reflected in that moment as well. Because the thing about the Medal of Honor is that you don't have to be a good guy to win it. You just have to do something remarkable. And there have been scoundrels and, and, and near-do-wells who've received the Medal of Honor. But once that medal is around your neck, it never leaves you at all. And it demands that you live up to that medal. And that to me is one of the most interesting things about the Medal of Honor is the demands that uh, an award, the lionization of, of a person, the demands that it puts on you. Mm -hmm. And pretty much to a man, it, they have lived their lives kind of according right. uh, to the respect that is just absolutely engendered by wearing that medal. Yeah. Right. Well said, well said. Yeah. I want to I take the time to kind of open it up uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, I don't want to, I have a lot more questions of my own, but it's, I, if anybody's, uh, you know, willing to, you know, to ask a question, uh, there's a, a mic here in the middle, I'll, uh, if you, just feel free to come up, and you know, if I'm talking, you can definitely interrupt me to, you know, answer or a uh, statement. Answer something or you want statement to say about the movie, yeah. please. Yeah, please. Yeah. But uh, another another thing that I want to I want to ask, I want to ask is, when you first performed uh, in front of the service members, you know, what did you feel, you know, being there like in country in in Iraq or, or Afghanistan, for instance, when you were mm -hmm. in Bagram, like. What did you feel, you know, the, if, if anything? Did you feel a profound uh, effect, like a profound effect, like, okay, here I am, if I'm in theater, you mm -hmm. know, I'm in country where these guys have, you know, have, have slept in, 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 uh, in foxholes who have, uh, you know, been on, uh, mount, uh, hiking through mountains, yeah. you know, have done, done their duty time and time again, 24 hours a day. Like, what did you feel from that? I think I, just, I, f I felt uh, available. I just wanted to make myself available. I mean, personally, uh, look, I've always said that I'm glad that, that our military feels that they get something out of this because there's, but I think it goes without, you could probably understand that I probably get more out of it than, than anybody does. And so it's a little unfair in that respect. But uh, I just, uh, I, I feel, when, when, when I'm there, I, f I feel that I want to be available to, to, to answer any questions, to take any picture that they want to take, to listen to any story that they want to tell. That's what I came there, came there for. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think. Yeah. I'm sorry. We yes, get, sir. We have a few Hello. Uh, thank you guys for coming out and sharing your time with us. Uh, my question is to you, Mr. Lang. I'm very curious in doing a one-man show where you have such a variety of characters and coming kind of one out of the other. How do you remain focused in one of them that you're not kind of muddling the two? And, and what kind of tricks do you have to keep those characters so strong as you jump from one to the other? In the, in the, in the, the theater, we, uh, one of the things we would always say is uh, uh, you never want to get caught acting, right? You don't want your acting to show, ever. But this is a little different, isn't it? Because this is showcasing the, uh, what I call quite <laughs> pompously probably, the architecture of acting. I mean, you actually are seeing transitions mm -hmm. and they're not deep trans, I'm not, you don't see me getting into character. You see me becoming a character. Now part of that is the fact that I've done it many, many times, but it's also the design of the show that when I make the first transition from uh, this, the sea, sailor John Finn into Clarence Sasser, the medic, 
that transition should pass you by. You see it, but you don't clock it. You, you go, because you've never seen the show before. And you go, what, what, what was that? Oh, I think he just became somebody else. So I'm a little bit ahead of you. And then the second time that I do it, you're getting more ready for it. You may not know when it's gonna happen, but then you see it, and then you see it, and that becomes part of the dynamic of, of the show. That becomes part of what I am, a better word, selling in this show. So actually, I don't mind you seeing the, the acting here, mm -hmm. the process. It's not deep, it's not dense. Hopefully the stories, the words, will, will then take you and you feel you're getting a, a rich and full experience. But the actual process of going in is not one of, it's not a labored kind of a thing at all. Now, I mean, your, your gestures, your movements, and your voice is very different amongst most of the characters. Is, is there ever the challenges where you find yourself kind of falling into, oh, shit, that's the wrong one, that's the wrong guy? Or Not yet. I haven't done it, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a young man. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you for coming out. My question's for you, Mr. Lang. Um, when coming up with all the mannerisms and all the different accents and the different body movements, the posture that you have to have for each of the characters, for each of the people. How do you do it? How do you focus into one of them in the process of creating the show? Way before you even do it for the first time. How does the process work for you? Uh, it's a rehearsal. It's a, you just go into a room. I, I worked on this at the Actors Studio which is my home in New York on 44th Street. And uh, it's a room. <laughs> and I can go in there and I can bounce off the walls. I can do whatever I, whatever I want. But uh, well, once you find the voice of the cat, I, I did this one no different than I do any other thing. And they're all different. Every time you approach a role, you, you an actor? Yes. Yeah. Every time you approach a role, you're going to reinvent the process. That's what you're going to learn. If there's one way to you, you're, you're doing, if you're doing every part in the same way, if this is what I do, this is what I do, this is what I do, well, you're going to miss an awful lot of terrain, you know, at some point. You need to reevaluate the process every time you do it. You're going to find that certain things that you do are fundamentally still sound from role to role. You're going to find that others are not. We can talk about acting all, all day. Uh, so good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. But what about? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of the the filmic stuff. Is uh, uh, you know, what, what's not working for you all? Um, I noticed you had a lot of different uh, accents when you were uh, um, right, in your You're military watching, experience huh? and whatnot. Paying attention, yeah, huh? Ar like a lot of Ireland and whatnot. Is that part of your character? Or is that um, are you from Ireland or where? How does uh... no? I've been, I've been to I've been to Ireland. No, but I like Ireland a lot. Yeah. Um. Okay. All right. You and you get you, get, you got a lot of a uh, different a lot of military experience. So um, I think it was very it was very enjoyable. Um, I just like you, you, a lot of energy, and, uh, and your persona is strong. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Who, who, who here is military, by the way? Oh, good wow, bunch of cool. you. Good. Thank Both. you all. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi there. Uh, I have a, kind of a statement, and then uh, it's going to go into a question. One, so um, huge fan from when I was too young to probably be watching the movies that you were in. Uh, the one that stands out was a movie oh, in 91. Guess. I know what it was. Which one? Band of the Hand. The Hard Way. The Hard Way, that's what I meant. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, just your character in that was awesome. You have this running theme of being in just an all-star cast, and you'll be the one that stands out. So then you're in this entire thing where you're, you're, you're it. You're, you're the entire cast. What's the difference in doing something with the rest of the cast versus the entire show being like on your shoulders? Uh -huh. um, and then my second question, this small, well, that was one. Another question is when 
traveling all the different military bases, what was your least favorite part about dealing with the DOD or going, you know, wearing your flak jacket, all that stuff, just oh, the technical I, stuff? Because traveling with the military yeah, is never fun. I, I don't recall having any uh, problems with with ever with the Department of Defense. Uh, I. Uh, I mean, it's all a problem. It's all, you know, you're schlepping, man. It's a big pain in the neck. You're, uh, it, you're going to difficult places and you're traveling in, in sort of hard-edged vehicles a lot of times. So uh, it's just, it's flat out hard on, 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 on the body, but uh, that's, all, that's, what you, that's what I signed up for on the tour and I liked every moment of it. Uh, and the other thing uh, is, uh, was about uh, acting with other people as opposed to acting with myself? Yes. Well, I can count on me. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, the cast parties are so boring. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I, don't, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I miss acting with, I, if I'm not acting with other people, I miss it. It's, this is a lo it's lonely doing, doing this show. You know, it's very, and, and uh, when my stage, I have a stage manager who's been with me now, and, and I, I love him, and he comes back, he'll come back and give me the half hour call, the 15 minute call, the five minute call, and then he'll say goodbye to me. And it always breaks my heart, because he's going up to the booth, and I said, well, what's gonna happen now? And he, <laughs> what's gonna happen? And he says, a guy named Jim will come at places, and he will guide you like you're two years old over to where you go on, and then you'll go on and you'll do the show. It's just sort of very, very lonely uh, uh, to do it. And then you get out there, and it's great, because you're, you're, uh, you're r relating to the audience, you know? I mean, they become your partners, hopefully. Yeah. Cool. Did that answer it? It's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for coming. And my name is Aina. I'm from China. And I'm a filmmaker here. I have a question for our uh, acting master. Um, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi. I thought, I thought Bobby Duval was behind me. <laughs> uh, I mean, the way you explain human and soldier is very inspiring for me. So, for like, what's your experience to work with like young filmmaker? I mean, director. Mm -hmm. I mean, when the director is not ex experienced as you, mm -hmm. what's your opinion? And uh, what's your suggestion for our young directors? Well, I, I think we don't need to pretend we know, we know everything. <laughs> that's well, what that's directors a, do. <laughs> really? Okay. That's a, good for you. Uh, I love working with young directors, you know, there's, when you sign up aboard a project, there, uh, aside from whatever contract you may actually sign to do it, there's an implicit contract between myself and the director that I'm, I'm a part of a vision that he or she has, and I want to do everything I can to serve that vision. And sometimes it may require me moving outside of my own comfort zone to, to do something that, well, maybe I didn't see it that way. Now, a really, really fine director will read his or her cast and will learn ways to come closer, to bring, to bring the actor closer without the actor maybe even uh, uh, knowing it. I mean, it becomes a real meeting of minds. There's a tremendous amount, depending on who you work with, there can be a lot of diplomacy involved. I'm not a negotiator in terms of my acting. You want, I mean, I work with different directors in different ways. If I work for Michael Mann, I have three ways, three things I say to Michael. Yes, sir. No, sir. My fault, sir. <laughs> That's it. And it works real good. <laughs> and within that, I can find lots and lots of freedom, it seems to me. And then I work with a director like Larry, and I say, excuse me, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> what? But, and, and then you go off and do it. <laughs> Exactly. In, in our first movie, uh, and and the thing that you, know, you may or may not know about, see, when Stephen was working on Avatar, um, and he had about five days uh, between retakes and, and, and looping, and he went and he did uh, our, our movie, a movie called Christina, that he basically, well, the entire budget of the movie was probably one day of, of CG work in Avatar, and he didn't care. He liked the part, he flew in, we never met before, 
and he did the role. He, we shot like 80 pages in four days or something with him in it. And um, so, he, you know, he's a guy that is really all about the work. There was one point where, and he plays a, 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 a 1940s German police inspector, and he did the accent, and he would talk to me in the accent the entire time. And there was a point where I just gave him this direction. I said, you know, I don't know. I just, I, it's just this character in this moment, he just needs a kind of a, a, a mid mid 40s sense of ennui about him and he just walks away grumbling mid 47 ennui <laughs> and he goes back and he does it so i mean that's the kind of actor he is so you know he, he <laughs> whether he understood that's why it or, i go what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about but you did it <laughs> all right whatever anyway does that answer your question young lady yes thank you no i know from china yeah, thank you. Now I know from China has a dream. I dream someday I can work with you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Steve, I uh, hate to throw a little bit of this is your life at you, but I was smart enough back in 1977 to give you your first job. You remember St. Joan? Oh, sure. St. Joan. I... Uh, you, did you cast it? I cast it and directed it. Come on. Well, is that John? Yeah. Clark? Yes. Hi. You, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's me who's changed. John, it's good to see you, brother. Thank good you. To see you oh, too, I worked Steve. with. I was very proud to see you. You know, uh, I was very proud to give you this one line part. I wasn't always so smart. I then auditioned a gentleman, and I thought he has no talent, and he's going nowhere, and I rejected him. It was Kevin Klein. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it resonated with me when you talked about the problems of shooting a one-person per theatrical show. Uh, as you may or may not know, I did do uh, a show uh, uh, called Shakespeare for my father of with course. my wife, Lynn Redgrave, and uh, we never got to film it. Now, part of the problem, this was 1993, part of the problem was that Actors' Equity said, you cannot, sorry, you're not allowed to film a, a stage performance. Uh -huh. They would allow one to, to, to do it, and it would go to the Lincoln the Center archives. Library, sure. if you remember. Yeah. But as for uh, shooting uh, the whole thing for commercial reasons, they, they said no. Now, I'm not saying we couldn't do it, uh -huh. but it would have cost a lot of money right. and we would have had to do it sort of surreptitiously. But uh, it bothered me that I never found a way to turn it into a movie. Sure. And I thought he, what you did was, was terrific. Uh, I, I envied you for your creative thoughts. The idea of matching uh, shots going from one scene to another and suddenly a, a, a different a different venue that was really clever and uh, I thought you found ways of making it very very interesting and I do want to congratulate you on it maybe I should have employed you at that time to help me <laughs> you anyway. did employ me John I, I love being part of that show it's a very it's a very wonderful memory in my life being with some of the best actors in New York, and some of them are uh, journeyman actors, some you've heard of. Lynn Redgrave was the star, but you, you know, you've never heard of Phil Bosco or Joe Bova or Paul Shire or uh, Paul Spare or Bobby Lupone. Or, wow, wow, uh, you remember the entire cast. Armin Shimmerman or Peter Van Norden. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I remember every one of them. They were all good buddies of mine. I made a lot of money at poker during that <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you, brother. Thanks Thank again. Thank you, John. Both of Thank you. you. Both of you. Thank you. That was nice. So I have a question also, um, just in regards to Beyond Glory again. I want to know um, if any character, specific character, or should I say not character within itself, but did you feel connected to any story to the point where you 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 got to uh, to say like oh my god this is deeper shit than I than I ever imagined mm. you know I mean and what did you what did you feel at that particular point did it become something that just continuously just resonated with you larger than you know the other stories 
or was it kind of like, okay, this is what I feel, this is what I got, and here's what I'm going to do with it? You know, they're all my children, and on any particular day, uh, one children, one child is your favorite. Right. Uh, uh, and but but it always changes. So I f I feel pretty uh, connected to all of them. But you know, the war that I uh, I grew up with was Vietnam. That's the war that was in my lifetime. World War II and Korea both preceded me. And so uh, I think that I probably do feel a special pff, responsibility, in a way, to, uh, uh, to, to Admiral Stockdale and to Clarence Sasser and to, to Nick Bacon, who were the Vietnam recipients, partly because, maybe because, the, uh, they were not, they were not lauded in any in any way, you know. Mm -hmm. it was, they were, uh, and, and in many cases, the the veterans of that war were uh, were vilified and and slammed for things that had nothing to do with them. That had to do with the political uh, climate or leadership of the time. So I think that you know, I think that they resonate with me deeply. And of course, when you form a personal connection with somebody, and as I say, Clarence Sasser and I are, are pals, uh, which uh, now when I do them, I hear his voice and I realize how <laughs> inadequate mine is in the role. Mm. So, but, uh, you know, but truthfully, I, um, and you know, since there, since each one of these things is sort of a, its own little one act thing, each with its own beginning, middle, and, and ending, that, that, that means that on any given night, w one can rise up in a way to dominate. And uh, for example, I mean, there are many times, it's very easy to be brought to tears in this show for the performer and, and for the audience, certainly in the live version. And I have had it where, on occasion, where the relationship between John Finn and his wife Alice got me so, just got me, and you, uh, you, I kind of shoot my wad, my emotional wad in the first one, and I still got another 70 minutes to go, you know? So, so you have to learn to kind of, kind of measure it out, you know? The old adage in the theater, if you cry, they won't. <laughs> so, I try not to. Another thing I just want to ask, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm asking be a lot sorry. of you questions. Can ask me anything. I'm, I'm just very fascinated Delighted. about this, and I feel like you've done like a, a very honorable thing, uh, just embodying these particular stories, you know, from these different timelines, you know. And as a, as a vet myself, have uh, you know, been a part of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, I just kind of like wanted to know, do you, what did it take? What did you take home from all of this? From being around, from traveling around, mm -hmm. for um, visiting which each Medal of Honor uh, Medal of Honor recipient, and then also traveling to Korea, to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Japan. Um, what what was it, what did you get from this? Like a personal take home for you? What did, what was like a realization or, or? Yeah, maybe it'd be a little unexpected what I'd say, but you know we've come. Uh, We've, we do this thing in this country where we automatically uh, label our military personnel as heroes. I mean, I've, you've all kind of experienced that, they're, they're heroes. Well, that's kind of like one of those deals like, you know, if everybody's a winner, nobody's a winner, or, you know, if everybody gets a, gets a medal, a, a, a trophy, then what's it worth? What I've come away with, I really, I, I'm very, very fond of the military. All the branches. I have a lot of affection for the Navy. Right. They facilitate a lot for me, but I love the Army, boots on Navy. the ground. Love them, and Marines are in their way. You can't beat them. I played this in front of 600 drunk-on-their-ass Marines, which was <laughs> one, of the, one of the toughest shows I've ever done. And, you know, it goes without saying, well, actually, I will say, it, the Air Force is always the best audience out of the military. Because they're never busy. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just, Sorry, when they get off the golf course, there's nothing they like better than, than coming and watching a, a play. And they are, they're, they're, they're more sophisticated. Sorry. It's just the way it is. But, but, uh, but my take, my, my, my takeaway is that these are, you know, just decent people 
doing a hard job. A lot of it's boring as shit. You know, it's not all like the ads out there, being all you can be and like the few, the proud and jumping out of airplane. A lot of it is just scraping the rust off of stuff. Tell and you it. know about oh, it. Oh, yeah, I was the engineer. And, <laughs> and so, and, and just that, that kind of uh, lunch bucket uh, uh, labor uh, demands r respect to, fr from me. And at the same time, they made it that the, the motives that people have in joining are genuinely uh, um, really fine. It seems to me they want to serve, serve their country. And you know, I mean, it's like Vernon Baker says, this is the only country that I have. And, uh, and I, we, we want this country to be as great as it can be. And, and that does involve a, a smart, uh, a forward-thinking uh, military, particularly now, because we live now, we live in a perpetual state of war. We're at war to the extent where we don't even realize it or think about it very much, but we're at war and we're gonna be at war for a long time. It's a terrible, terrible, uh, sobering tru truth, I believe. That's the way it is, and so, we need to keep our military up to the mark and, and make sure it's the right people who are getting the right, doing the right things, getting the right, right message, you know, mm. across. And I think by and large it is. I mean, I've been extremely impressed wherever I go by them. So just they're important in our lives and I want to know what's going on with them. You know, we all have, you get in this business, everybody gets their pet cause. And, I, and I, I want animals to be safe, and uh, I want equal rights for everybody. And I also feel the military is Im <laughs> important. You know, it's right. like a, gotcha. it's kind of a thing, you know. I'm, I'm interested in it, and I've always been interested in history and all that. So that's, that's kind of it. I don't know if that's a takeaway, but that's what I feel. Yes, sir. This is for um, Mr. Lang. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question is, having done these roles so many times and for so many years, do you look at any of them any differently or perform them any differently now? Maybe I'm simplifying as I get older. I'm a very, uh, been told uh, by a director or two that I'm a very Baroque actor. I like my curly cues, you know? I embroider. And, uh, and I still do to some extent, but hopefully I'm simplifying as I get as I get older. You know, T.S. Eliot once said, the great poet, uh, the great anti-Semitic poet once said, <laughs> <laughs> he once said, uh, he was talking about poetry, he said what he was trying to achieve was a state of complete and utter simplicity costing not less than everything. Wow. And that's what I really, that to me is not a bad description of acting. I just want to be clear, direct, honest, and truthful, but the road there is filled with curly cues and blind alleys and uh, lots of uh, lots of detours and wrong turns. So hopefully, as you get older, as I get older, I just simplify. That's what I'd like to do, and with these guys as well. I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name's Elise, and I want to thank you for your performance. Um, I uh, was doing acting before I became an American soldier, and um, I started writing journals while I was in. Mm -hmm. And um, I can relate to um, a lot of the elements I think you brought into the way that you tell your story and the tempo and the voice, along with the images and the transition. And I think e even though... Marines, Navy, Air Force, you know, they're people and they're wearing a uniform. Um, and that there's an era too from Vietnam to Operation Iraqi Freedom, which is current. So I think a lot of that can kind of cross over in the sense of humanity. Um, and I kind of saw that in, in what I watched today um, as I'm trying to put my um, journals together for a story for myself yeah. um, to kind of like tell tell the story, the storytelling that's within. And I think there's a lot of um, stories that were performed by you where I could see a strong element that could really relate to um, service members um, knowing how to remember, but maybe in a better way, 
rather than shutting down. And right. I think in that sense, it kind of has a healing, um, I guess, perspective to, to that. And I think in that way, um, that can go a long way, um, as it, as you continue or add in another character or it stays to the way that you've done it. Um, I like the ending in the sense that you walk out, but you don't walk out because you're carrying equipment, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there's a lot of things I'm sure I could probably say so much more. Um, but as a service member myself and an actress and a writer, um, there's a lot of elements that I think are really powerful in the way that you um, share yourself um, and the characters and the people that you honor um, with everyone today. Thank you. That's a very nice thing to hear. You know, one of the things that I like about, uh, one of my favorite things about the show, which actually is not at all featured in the film, is the Foot Locker. Because uh, this entire show, of course, comes out of a Foot Locker. And for me, that is where the theater and the military meet. Because actors traditionally live out of the trunk. That's what it all comes out of. And of course, the military, their footlocker is your home, essentially. So I like, I like, I like, I mean, the theater and uh, the theater and the military are not, you know, you don't think of them as natural sort of partners and everything, but to me, they are. I think they, really they can are. become kind of one in the same that you're playing a role. You know, I am a soldier, I am an airman, I am E4, I am a command sergeant major. What makes that different, you know, in the way that you think or walk? And I think there's a kind of performance in the sense of that because you're realizing yourself, but you're learning elements of honor, integrity, and selfless service in a way that maybe civilians may not encounter um, because of the way of things being constructed or guided. And I think in that way, I think performance, acting, and telling the story um, and maybe what you connect with um, is really what, what shares one heart outward, you know. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> well, so another, another question of mine. I know I keep asking you, Handy, with so many questions. Um, <clears throat> just one thing I, I wanted to know is, is when you were in the presence of the Medal of Honor recipients. Mm -hmm. I mean, what were some of the, the stories that, it's kind of like behind the scenes uh, that's not featured, uh, you know, with inside this film. You know, some of the things that uh, maybe you didn't just touch stone on or you just felt like uh, that was more so personal for you to, to keep to, you know, keep mm -hmm. to yourself. Well, I went, uh, I mean, I've gone, been invited down to the, every year, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, which is comprised, one would say it's the most exclusive fraternity in the country because it's <laughs> Medal of Honor recipients. And they get together for a convention and they, they vote on things and dispense scholarships and everything. It's quite an extraordinary group of, of fellas. And uh, um, uh, it's always an honor to be with them. And they, uh, it, all, it gets very ceremonial at times, and then at other times it's extremely informal. And of course, so many Medal of Honor recipients are walking around nursing wounds that they've had for 30, 40, 50 years. So you're talking about guys who have been through a lot. So it's always very uh, 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 humbling uh, to be with them, but they're just kind of normal normal guys but w just one in I'll share one inside story and before we wrap it up uh, one of the one of the I, I, I did treat I've done many stories of other Medal of Honor recipients these are the guys who are in Beyond Glory I did uh, I don't know if you know who Senator Bob Kerry was he was a mm, senator from course. Nebraska uh, he made a brief uh, kind of sniff at president at the presidency uh, running and uh, he used to go with Linda Ronstadt and uh, and it, any, anyway uh, he received them he was in Vietnam for for a total of 51 days. And he received, two things happened to him during that time. He performed an action for which he received the Medal of Honor and he was part of a massacre, an atrocity, a war, war atrocity. And, uh, and that's all within the space of 52 days. Of course, after, it was the Medal of Honor that he lost a lot of flesh and uh, got beat up and so he was out, out, out country immediately after that. You can't, what I found was in telling that story and doing the treatment, you can't tell one without the other. Can't do it. And, and what, it, what did that do? It brought in a very, very ugly element and, and what I would call a political element it, uh, in, into, into the play. 
And uh, so I, I, I went to him, I called him. He was the president of the New School in New York. I called his office, told him what I was doing, made an appointment, I went in and I performed Bob Carey for Bob Carey, whereas where I talked not only about receiving the Medal of Honor, mm -hmm. but what it's like to perpetrate a massacre on a village. And it was, one, it was probably the weirdest performance I've ever given in my life. He's sitting at his desk, I'm across, and I'm doing him. <laughs> and after it was over, he sat back and said, okay, you can use it. And I said, okay, good. And I thought, good for you. And then about a month later, I cut it. <laughs> from the show. And I ran into him about three months later at a, some event in New York. He said, how's the show come? I said, I said, Senator, the show is coming very well. However, I've cut you from the show. <laughs> 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 and, and I could see he, he was slightly <laughs> relieved and slightly disappointed <laughs> at the same time. But I mean, trying to find the right balance of, you know, I wanted the right, I wanted a diversity in services. I wanted a diversity in wars and I wanted a diver diversity in just Americans, you know, all types. So that's what it is. So anyway, uh, right. shall we, uh, is, unless anybody has anything else yeah. compelling to say, we, uh, yeah, the question should, uh, What kind of food do you eat? Like, do you just eat <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for you to ask me that. <laughs> when, when you act, and you, you, you do it since you, you're constantly acting, you got show to show to show to show, isn't there days where you wake up and you're just like, it's like, well, fuck, like, I don't want to do this. I mean, you're human, right? So it's like, you are human. Well, that's your first are you, mistake. Are you human? So, uh, so, yeah. so it's like, how do you wake up and just... And you're just like, okay, like I have to do this, cause I, I, I know sometimes I wake up and I'm as an actor, I'm like, wow, fuck. Like. <laughs> He's just not the day I want to be doing this. I understand. But you have to understand, I'm an old character actor. I got to be there. You're a young, handsome star. You can do whatever you want, son. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you what. If you don't feel like it, then you just stay in that trailer. And don't you come out. And I, and I support you on that. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be on set ready to go. But don't worry about me. All right? So, I, you know, we all got to go at it the way we go at it. And I, and I understand and I'm down with what you do. <laughs>